All right, so welcome back, New York Ranger fans, as well as Carolina Hurricane fans. We got a very special crossover edition for you guys here today. This is John Chick with Locked On New York Rangers, joined by my good friend Jared Ellis of Locked On Carolina Hurricanes. Jared, congrats on the game one win, man, and uh, how are we feeling today? Feeling good, feeling good. I'm really looking forward to game two tonight. I think it's going to be really, really fun. I think it's going to be really, really rowdy in PNC Arena. Hopefully we don't have anyone getting kicked out and arrested again. I would definitely agree with that. And, you know, it's crazy because both of our teams, you know, they, they kind of took the long road to get here. They both went seven games in their respective first round series. And it's crazy, man, because, you know, we did that uh, crossover edition at the end of the regular season. And I wouldn't have dare said this at the time, but I kind of had a feeling, man, you, you and me weren't done. I had a feeling that this could happen. They might end up seeing each other in the second round. I mean, obviously it was not easy for either team, but did you think this might happen or do you think it might be, you know, Kane's penguins? I mean, just, just how did you feel about that? I definitely thought it, there was a strong chance it could happen because, you know, obviously Pittsburgh, you know, they took you to game seven. It very well could have been the penguins here, but I think, you know, Pittsburgh being older, be, dealing with injuries, not the best goaltending. I think a lot of, Things just mounted up for Pittsburgh, and you know, now you're here and not uh, Hunter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and I figure, obviously, we'll get to the game one stuff in just a second. We'll take a look ahead at game two and what to expect for the rest of the series. But, um, you know, while we're on the subject here, I got to at least ask you about your thoughts on, uh, you know, the game seven against the Bruins. Obviously, the Canes kind of had their way with the Bruins in the regular season. Ends up going seven games. The home team won all seven games in that series. And the last 20 seconds of that game, man, I mean, you had to be holding your breath at least a little bit. That was wild, was it not? Yeah, it definitely was. Home ice, you know, we were talking about that, you know, at the end of the regular season, just how crucial home ice was going to be in the playoffs. And yeah, at the time, the Hurricanes had home ice in at least the first round. So you look at that series and how the Hurricanes won all the home games and then game one, the other night as well, just how crucial home ice is. I think that if the Hurricanes didn't have home ice advantage in that series, that it, you'd be here talking with Ian and not me. Fair enough. And it might be honestly the same deal. I mean, it might be Ian and Hunter right now, you know, having this conversation about the second round, um, you know, had it not been for the fact that both of our teams had home ice advantage. You know, the Rangers obviously fell down three to one to the Penguins, came storming back. I mean, game four was an absolute nightmare, but uh it's crazy, man. You know, we've seen teams come back from three to one and I was hearing out on social media from penguin fans and you're just kind of letting me have it. And, oh, you know, Igor's no good. He's overrated this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, dude, like this series is not over. Like, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but it's not impossible to come back from three games to one down. And uh, mm -hmm. I will say this, Jared, you know, obviously I'm disappointed that the Rangers didn't win game one, but it was so nice to finally uh, watch a game where the Rangers season was not on the line. They could lose and they're not done, you know? So that was kind of refreshing from, from my perspective, for sure. Yeah. And then looking at game one, it wasn't like the Rangers played bad. They won the first two periods. They were the better team through the first 40 minutes. And it wasn't really until the third period started that the hurricanes made it a game. And the only reason it was, one nothing going into that third period because of Auntie Ranta. And yeah, because if it wasn't for him, that that game could have been over early. It could have been three nothing going into the third or worse. Yeah, for sure. Now, were you all at all surprised by how game one started? Because honestly, like going into this series, I, I thought it would probably end up being a split the first two games, but I kind of had a feeling that, you know, the Canes would get the jump on the Rangers in game one. You know, obviously the Rangers had just been through an absolute dogfight of a series, uh, three winner go home games in a row against the Pittsburgh Penguins. I had a feeling like the Canes might be a little bit fresher. They had an extra day of rest as well. Um, but the Rangers really got the jump on them. And then of course the Canes rallied late, got the win in overtime. Were, were you surprised? Because I'm just not used to seeing that from the Canes where, you know, they're caught a little bit flat footed for the first couple of periods. That's not like them at all. Yes and no. Uh, I, I was surprised that it was as bad as it was. Uh, but as far as like a slow start, we've seen that from the hurricanes, uh, in the regular season, we saw it in the Boston series. And so it wasn't necessarily something that surprised me as like, Oh, what is this? You know, this team never does this. It, 
it was the fact of just how bad it was and, and just how long it took them to wake up, honestly. And I think there was, I mean, there could have been a variety of things, you know, from the hurricanes perspective. Uh, but I do think, yeah, on the Rangers side of things, I think they were a little bit mad, to be honest. I mean, you look at the very end of the regular season, you know, maybe you had some emotion carry over from that. And then obviously frustration from your Pittsburgh series of just how that ended and not wanting to have this series go the same way. Uh, but yeah, the Hurricanes, they definitely caught me off guard a little bit of just how flat they came out in game one. Obviously, I'm glad they're able to turn it around and get the win, but that is going to be something they really, really need to work on in game two, three, four, heading on into conference final, cup final. It, that's got to be something that they get under control. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, if you're a Ranger fan, you know, kind of just building off of what you said there, Jared, I think there's two schools of thought here. On one hand, you're very encouraged because, okay, we just went toe-to-toe -to -toe with this team that beat us three out of four games in the regular season. Of course, they met a couple of years ago in the playoffs. We remember how that went. The Canes swept the Rangers right out. Um, so the Rangers, you know, they kind of took the fight to them. I thought they were out skating them in the first two periods, winning some board battles, which is not an easy thing to do against the Carolina Hurricanes, and really did everything but win this game. You know, maybe got caught, and, and granted, you know, Carolina had a nice push in the third period, but might have been a situation where, you know, the Rangers did uh, too much sitting back and just trying to kind of lay on the lead, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. So there was that. But then, you know, the reason why th there's a little bit of an ominous feel right now, and by no means am I panicked or giving up or anything like that, but it's just like, man, you know, the Kings, they weren't their best for two periods. You had the jump on them. You had the lead with less than three minutes to go, and you still lost the game. Like, that's that's a little bit of a gut punch. Um, you know, I do think the Rangers will respond well to this tonight, but uh, yeah, very, very disappointing. Again, not panic time, but uh, for me, it's just something that feels like a missed opportunity for the Rangers uh, in game one there. Yeah, I would definitely agree. It did feel like a, a very big missed opportunity for the Rangers. It felt like in that third period, they really just changed their game. You know, they didn't do what they were doing in those first two periods. They took their foot off the gas, so to speak. And they gave the Hurricanes opportunities. And then, like you said, less than three minutes to go, Sebastian Ajo, he went up, took advantage of an opportunity, tied the game. He and Cole did it in overtime. It definitely, that's been something that the Hurricanes have had issues with during the regular season. They take their foot off the gas at the end, and you can't do that, especially at this time of the year. Yeah, for sure. And I definitely want to ask you about, you know, Ian Cole. I mean, of all people, him scoring the game winner in overtime. Uh, we'll get to that in just a second. But, Jared, I, I figure first we can tell everybody about Bilt Bar here. Um, so, I love brownies. I think Jared loves brownies. Do you not? Absolutely. It's the best dessert. <laughs> I agree 100%. Uh, but you know what I love even more? Brownie batter. Sometimes I eat half the batter just while I'm making the brownies. And you're in luck right now because Bilt has a new creation, and this one is better than ever. The brownie batter puff. You heard me right. This puff takes protein bars to a whole new level, and they're available right now on Built.com. With 140 calories, 17 grams of protein, and only 7 grams of sugar, brownie batter puffs are the perfect pick-me-up for any day. All Built, buff, all Built puffs are covered in 100% real chocolate. That means that with Built, you can eat healthy and actually enjoy doing it. And they are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides a ton of health benefits. The brownie batter puffs will have you completely forgetting that you are eating a protein bar. No need to pinch yourself. This is real life. Go to Built.com to get brownie puffs right now. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, and get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. Yeah, man, I mean, the... the all, all the built bars are great. I think any of them that are anything having to do with brownies, though, probably my personal favorite. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so anyway, I definitely wanted to ask you about, you know, obviously the Canes late game heroics there. Uh, the Canes actually made, uh, juggled their lines a little bit in the third period. Obviously, Rod Brendan Moore looking to kind of spark them, get something going. If I'm not mistaken, I believe Tara Vinen uh, moved up to the top line. And, uh, you know, him and Jarvis and Ajo were the ones that kind of linked up for that game tying goal there. Um, mm -hmm. just, just your thoughts on Brenda Moore's in-game adjustments there. And I'm also wondering, do you think they'll stick with those new line combinations for the second game or kind of go back to what they did against Boston? Yeah. So when it comes to jumbling up lines like that, Rod, he's, he'll do that 
all the time. Uh, well, not all the time, but it he'll do that whenever games aren't going the Hurricanes way. He'll you know change things up, try to spark something. So that wasn't necessarily a surprise for me. Again, you know, he's known to do that. The lines are very much fluid throughout the game, whether the Hurricanes are winning or not. So it, that wasn't a very big surprise there. And actually, just before we started recording, uh, Hurricanes team reporter and show alum, Walt Ruff, uh, he tweeted out that the Hurricanes are sticking with their same line combinations from game one. So no changes there. Auntie Ronts is in the starter crease. So that's what we can expect from the Hurricanes. You know, same starting lineup from game one. That's what we're seeing tonight. Sounds good. I, I got to be honest. I'm, I'm kind of happy that, um, you know, Svechnikov and Aho and Tara Vinan are no longer on the same line. I mean, I know you guys have a lot of weapons and it, it's kind of like pick your poison. But man, that line just absolutely pretty much wrecked the Rangers a couple of years ago in the playoffs. So if you guys want to keep those three apart from each other, or at least not all three of them on the same line, I'm totally cool with that over here. <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, they'll still play together. It's just Seth Jarvis. He has been so freaking good on that yeah. top line. And it's very much a he got that opportunity up there on that top line and he just grabbed the bull by the horns, didn't let go. And he stayed there. Yeah, no, he's been awesome. I'm glad you brought him up. I was actually planning on, uh, you know, mentioning him to you. I mean, you know, somebody that I, I think among NHL rookies, he's up there as far as, you know, one, one of the better ones in the league this past season. So uh, what, what is it that makes him so good? I mean, how, how is he kind of, uh, you know, clicked on with that top line, would you say? I would say, yeah, just the situation he's in is very, very good. He's playing with a bunch of talented players. He's has a great head coach and great coaching staff. You know, he's in an organi organization that is renowned for developing young talent well. You look at Yesperi Kartniemi coming in from Montreal. They're not the best at that, and he's made up a lot of ground as far as his development goes this year. So, He's in a very good situation and also just watching him play. He does not play like a 20 year old. He plays with, he plays like someone that's been in the league for a few years. He doesn't get afraid of, you know, some big veteran guy coming, uh, coming barreling at him or whatever. Yeah. You know, he's not afraid. Uh, and he doesn't make rookie mistakes. I know there was, a portion kind of in the middle of the regular season he was kind of hitting a wall and he was able to get past that and you know he's not one that you know again he doesn't play like a rookie and that's the biggest thing I can say you know he plays with ex like he has years of experience under his belt he was definitely too good for juniors for sure and you know with his age you know it was either you go back to juniors you stay in the NHL and he earned every single bit of being in the NHL. He looked fantastic in camp, looked great in the preseason, his little trial period at the beginning of the regular season. He looked great there. So he's earned it. You know, he, his skill level, his hockey IQ, all of it. He's, he's going to be something special. And I saw a stat, uh, I want to say it was the day before yesterday. Or it was early yesterday morning uh, after the games last night. I'm not sure if it still holds true, but he was leading all rookies in the playoffs in points. So that's also very, very cool. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, hearing you describe him, it reminds me a little bit of Braden Schneider for the Rangers. You know, they the Rangers all season, really, or for a good chunk of the season, at least, they had a little bit of a revolving door as far as their third defense pairing was concerned. A lot of guys, you know, were kind of in and out of the lineup. A lot of guys were given opportunities ranging anywhere from, you know, career journeymen like Patrick Nemeth, uh, guys who were kind of holdovers like Libor Hayek, uh, Nils Lundqvist, a former first-round pick, he got a chance. Uh, Braden Schneider, who was a first-round pick in 2020, the same year that the Rangers took Lafreniere in the first round, he eventually got his opportunity. And uh, again, like kind of like how Jarvis did, I realized they played different positions, but uh, Braden mm -hmm. Schneider just taking the bull by the horns there and, um, you know, pretty much hitting the ground running in the NHL. And uh, at that point, they basically couldn't get him out of the lineup. I mean, they traded for Justin Braun at the deadline, and the thought was that that might put push Braden Schneider into the press box on a lot of nights, which it did temporarily, but he eventually found his way back out there. And now Patrick Nemeth is the odd man out of the lineup. But 
Uh, yeah, man, uh, Schneider, you know, he hit the ground running. He's only 20 years old. That's hard to believe. Um, he does have, you know, a quote unquote rookie moment every once in a while, you know, one or two turnovers in the yeah. series against Pittsburgh. But for the most part, I mean, I, I think if you're a Ranger fan, you, you got to be thrilled by what this guy has given you. And, you know, not only is it good because, okay, this is a great defenseman going forward, but he stabilized what I think was one of the Rangers one weaknesses. And that's, uh, you know, the bottom pairing as, as far as the defensemen are concerned. Yeah, I, I definitely agree there. And then you mentioned, yeah, he's just 20 years old. You know, give him a, another year or two. Maybe he's off of that third pair. Maybe he's moving up into the second or depending on what happens, maybe that first pair. Yeah, he's so young. The sky's the limit. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, I figure, uh, you know, we'll kind of uh, turn our attention to game two in just a second. But shall we uh, let everybody know first about betonline.net? Of course, we got to let them know about betonline.net. Game two is tonight. If you're a Rangers fan, you want to place a bet on the game. If you're a Hurricanes fan that wants to place a bet on the game, betonline.net is the place to go. Betonline.net is, of course, the official betting partner for the Locked On Podcast Network. They got you covered from the hockey playoffs, basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball season, fights, esports, and more. And of course, with Bet Online, they have live betting updates from scores, latest league reviews and news, and so much more. So right now you can go to betonline.net on your computer or mobile device to get started today. Betonline.net where the game starts. Yes, sir. And, uh, you know, Jared, I want to ask you, we've, we've talked about Antti Ranta. We've kind of glossed over him once or twice here. And obviously he's played very well for you guys here in the playoffs. Um, but I mean, how are you feeling about him, man? Because he's, he obviously made some really nice saves, uh, kept the Canes in game one against the Rangers. Obviously I'm sure you would like to get Freddie Anderson back, but, uh, do you feel like Ranta can hold down the fort for as long as the Canes need him to? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm really not worried there. He's another guy that He's taking the bull by his horns. You know, he obviously was dealing with injury at the tail end of the regular season. Bounced back, ready to go. He got knocked out in the Boston series, came back, didn't miss a beat. So I'm not really worried about him. Uh, I, I said this with Walt when he was on the show uh, during the Boston series that obviously everyone wants to know when Freddie is going to come back, but it's not a situation of, we need him back. It's just we want him back. We are in very capable hands with Auntie Ranta and Pyotr Kochekov. So it's – we want him back, and he was doing, like, some light, light practice uh, yesterday. But Rod Bernoy actually asked us to stop asking about Freddie and when he's coming back because he doesn't know and he won't know until Freddie get really starts practicing. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I always liked Ronta, man. Obviously, he spent a couple of seasons with the New York Rangers. He was the backup to Henrik Lundqvist. I, I think we might have actually even talked about this, uh, you know, during a previous crossover, Jared. But there was actually a time uh, where, you know, Lundqvist had a very minor injury, was going to miss a couple of games. Ronta stepped in and was just completely lights out. Like, you could not get the puck by him to the point that even when Lundqvist was available again, uh, they had to basically keep starting Ronta for the next handful of games. And uh, Lundqvist, you know, this was still prime Lundqvist. This wasn't tail end of his career, Henrik Lundqvist. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hank even said, he was like, yeah, man, listen, he's been amazing. I'd play him right now too. So uh, the fact that uh, Ronta, and I I realized it was just one instance and just a handful of games, but the fact that he could, um, you know, essentially very temporarily take the starting job away from a slam dunk Hall of Fame goalie in his prime. uh, Very, very impressive there when he did that. Yeah, absolutely. It's really the only concern that I have with Antioch is his injury history is, you know, he's very injury prone and, you know, the playoffs are notoriously tough on a hockey player's body. I mean, just look at Tristan Jari uh, at the end of the Rangers series. He comes into that presser with a bag of ice on his foot, you know, and, you know, stuff like that, you know, that would, that's really the only thing that worries me with him. Like, you know, can he stay healthy with it? But yeah, yeah, he has been lights out and he's living up to that potential that folks thought, you know, he once had, you know, to be a true starting goalie and, you know, obviously injuries took their toll, but, you know, he's looking every bit as 
you know, a playoff starting goalie right now. And I'm enjoying every second of it. He's the reads. Like I said earlier, he's the reason we won game one because he was a brick wall out there. Cause it, it if we had someone else in there, it easily could have been three, nothing four nothing. Yeah. It, it's funny because like, I, I'm so happy for him. It's so cool that he's on a good team and he's in the second round of the playoffs and he's doing his thing. And, you know, finally getting an opportunity to, you know, do this, be in, in deep in the Stanley cup playoffs. I just kind of wish he was doing it for, you know, some team in the Western conference. And I didn't have to worry about the Rangers having to try to, to beat him, which is uh, proving to be no easy task. At least if you look at game one. Um, but you know, I, I mentioned this earlier too. Ian Cole of all people getting the game winner in overtime. I think the last time we talked, you know, you mentioned that uh, he's somebody that uh, could at least be a candidate to maybe be a healthy scratch. What did you think when Ian Cole of all people puts that fuck in the net and gives you guys the winning game one there? I'm happy for it. Yeah. yeah. Or, or happy for him, you know, with yeah. that, you know, because I've said all season long, you know, that team is at their best when everyone is chipping in, you know, your top guys are playing like top guys, you know, Sebastian Ajo, your best player going down there, scoring the game time goal depth guy, not supposed to really score a bunch of goals. Yeah. You know, he's there just to you know, be a big body, break some people, make some good defensive plays. He's the one that scores the OT winner. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing with the playoffs. It can't always just fall on the top guys, the superstars. It, it can't always just be those guys. You need those depth guys, you know, to step up and do the same thing. You know, it's, Sees those moments. You look at Max Domi in uh, game seven against the Bruins. Same thing there. It can't always just be those top guys. So I absolutely love it. And I know Hurricanes fans, they absolutely loved it as well because, you know, yeah, he's not, you know, necessarily a guy that goes out there and scores a bunch of goals. That was his second goal of the season right there and his yeah. second career playoff goal as well. So everyone obviously really happy for it. You know, obviously, you know, don't expect him, you know, to go out in game two tonight, score a hat trick or anything like that. But yeah, it, it was great to see it. Yeah, it, it's it's one of the many reasons why I, I think the Stanley Cup playoffs are just awesome because, you know, you have an overtime game. Uh, you know, you, you look at the Rangers against the Penguins game seven. Uh, Artemi Panarin, one of the best players on the New York Rangers, hands down. Uh, he gets the game winner. Uh, earlier in that series, you know, the Penguins won in triple overtime and it was Evgeny Malkin, obviously one of their best players. But for every time that something like that happens, you get Ian Cole uh, scoring a goal in overtime and, uh, you know, giving his team the lead. So, man, the Stanley Cup playoffs are just awesome. And I, I think that's one of the big reasons why is anybody can be a hero on any given night. Yep. And that also just proves, you know, with the Hurricanes that you got to watch everyone. You can't just watch Sebastian Aja, Andre Sveshkov, Tavo Teravine. You can't just watch those guys. You got to watch everyone because anyone can score on any given night. Yeah, for sure. Um, I wanted to ask you about Derek Stepan. Is he kind of the odd man out? I mean, do you expect him to remain a, a healthy scratch going forward? Because, um, you know, if that happens, I'm actually okay with that as a Ranger fan because I've seen him have some pretty big moments in the playoffs. But, uh, yeah, just any, any thoughts on Stepan being, you know, kind of the odd man out right now, it would seem at least. Uh a little interesting. Uh, you know, when Martinuk was healthy, you know, you kind of expected that. But, you know, right now with Stepan being you know, out of the lineup, I think it was really because when Marty first went down, Stepan was in the lineup. And then come game seven, Stephen Lawrence slotted in, and he honestly played a little bit better than Derek Stepan. So that's why, you know, it's kind of just stayed the way it has. So, it's interesting because, you know, Derek Stepan, you know, he has played really good for the Hurricanes, but there also have been moments as well where, you know, a bit of a non-factor there on that bottom line. So it's one of those where it's kind of, yeah, yeah, you know, there's definitely some cons to it, but there's some pros as well because Stephen Lawrence has been playing really, really well. Fair enough. And uh, I want to also ask you, um, you know, and I'll throw out an answer for the Rangers as well, but is there anybody on the Canes that you feel has kind of like been an unsung hero uh, in the playoffs thus far? Because, you know, obviously both our teams had to go to seven games and, uh, you know, barely pulled it out. But um, yeah, I mean, anybody that really kind of stepped up in the Boston series and maybe even in game one against the Rangers that maybe isn't getting the attention that you feel he deserves? Yeah, I actually talked about this with Gil on the national show the other day. Uh, I feel there's a few guys, I think, 
uh, Seth Jarvis, who we talked about earlier, you know, yeah, you know, here in the Raleigh market, you know, he's obviously beginning attention and whatnot, but as far as like on a national level, uh, almost non-existent there. So I, I kind of want him to, you know, get a little bit more attention. It's kind of getting hogged up by the big names. Uh, I think Brett Pesci is another guy that he's played really good in that Boston series. He's been really great defensively. And Jacob Slavin is another one. Yeah, you know, everyone knows how good of a defensive defenseman he is. But because he doesn't make those flashy plays and whatnot, he just kind of sticks to a very, you know, he sticks to his game. And it's not very flashy. You know, he tends to get overlooked. And, you know, everyone knows how good he is. You watch him play like, God, this dude is insane. But again, you know, he's not one, he's not a defenseman that goes down there and scores a hat trick every other night. You know, he's not an offensive one. So, he gets overlooked in that kind of stuff because he doesn't have the highlight reel, you know, type plays. So as far as like on a national level, he's it's another guy that goes overlooked. And obviously he's gotten some attention, but Auntie Ranta, the guy has been insane. I wish people were talking about him more too. I agree. And we've actually talked about Slavin a couple of times in the past. And I totally agree. I think sometimes, you know, he gets overlooked because there's nothing really all that flashy about his game. He doesn't pile up the points the way that um, some of the other elite defensemen do. But man, that guy is solid as a rock. I, I think all 32 teams in this league would love to have him. Um, uh, as far as the Rangers, you know, I, I think I would have to throw out Ryan Lindgren because he missed a good chunk of the Pittsburgh series and the Penguins in games three and four, you know, save for one, uh, you know, good, uh, the second period that the Rangers had in game three, they were basically skating circles around the Rangers. And as soon as Lingering got back into the lineup in game five, it made a tremendous difference for the Rangers. Even Adam Fox, who he shares the ice with, you know, Fox wasn't always at his best in the series against, against Pittsburgh. But once Lingering got back into the lineup, I think he immediately started playing better. And you, know, you look at the other Ranger defense and you've got Fox, he's the Norris winner. He's always going to command a certain amount of attention. You've got Keandre Miller, you know, a rising superstar in his own right. You've got Jacob Truba, who just wrecks people out there. And I know everybody was all up in arms about the hit that he put on Crosby in the last series. So it's very easy for Ryan Lingren to get overlooked. But I, I think somebody that certainly was uh, an unsung hero of the series against Pittsburgh coming back in game five and helping the Rangers come back in that series. And also just for what he's done all season. I mean, the guy's just, it's kind of like slaving a little bit, just solid as a rock back there. Yeah. And I got two questions for you. One yes, is, you know, I mentioned earlier, just how the hurricanes need to get over their slow starts if they really want to win this series. Uh, what do you think the Rangers need to do in order to, you know, a uh, uh, problem they need to fix in order to win this series? Yeah. I mean, I think game one was good overall. You know, Gerard Gallant after the game said he thinks it's the best game that the Rangers have played all season. I don't know that I would necessarily go that far, but I can at least understand why he said that. Um, a, a big issue in the series against Pittsburgh was they pretty much did everything but roll out the red carpet for the Penguins to just go right to their net. I mean, they just, mm -hmm. there were so many instances where they just forgot to guard the slot. And when you watch the first two periods of this game, there were almost no quality scoring chances for the Canes. There was one where Igor had to make a really nice glove save. And, you know, he, that's what he does. You know, it's Igor Shesterkin. Um, but they defended really well. So I think everything's all good there. I think Igor had one of his better games of the playoffs because, you know, he wasn't tested in the first two periods, but he was, he came up big in the third, even the goal that Aho scored, he made a fantastic save on that. It's he just Aho got to his own rebound. So uh, I, I think in those areas, they're fine. Um, I, I think though, you know, they just need a little bit more offense from their top six guys. I was talking about this on my most recent episode, but you know, it feels like the Rangers, despite beating the Penguins, they haven't really had a game or at least not many games where all the lines are kind of, you know, clicking at the same time early against Pittsburgh, the kid line played great for the Rangers, the top six, mm -hmm. they were nowhere to be found. Then in games six and seven, you finally have Mika Zibanejad and Chris Kreider playing the way that they're capable of. And they led the Rangers to that win there or both of those wins. Really uh, Artemi Panarin, not his best in the Pittsburgh series either. Obviously he got the game seven game winner. So that was awesome. But I think overall, and this is going to be easier said than done against, you know, a very, strong defensive Carolina Hurricanes team. But I think the Rangers just need a little bit more from the top six. They just got to produce a, a couple more scoring opportunities than they did in game one. Because if the Rangers could have, and again, part of this is anti-Ranta, but if they could have taken a two-goal lead at some point, you know, Capo Caco missed a wide open net with about five minutes left. Yeah. 
if they could have boosted that lead to two nothing, I, I think they probably would have been able to hold the Canes off and you know gotten that first win. But just more offense from the top six. I, I think that's pretty much all. Um, the only thing that I can really point to uh, based on how game game one unfolded. Yeah, I, I definitely agree there. I mentioned that wide open uh, miss on my show as well. And then honestly, probably the most important question I'm going to ask you this entire series is where's your playoff beard? So get this. And I haven't even told this, uh, this story on my, on my own podcast yet. Uh, let's fa- let's rewind back to 2015. The Rangers are playing the Carolina hurricanes in the uh, second round of the playoffs. I know you're no fan of the caps either. Or, no, mm-hmm. I-, I misspoke there. They were playing the caps in the second round of the playoffs. So it goes three to one caps. And uh, I end up shaving my beard because I said, you know what? We need a fresh start here. This is, this is not going the Rangers way. We're in dire straits here. And in that round, the Rangers came back and won games five, six, and seven and advanced to the Eastern Conference Finals. I did the exact same thing this year. When it went three to one Pittsburgh, I said, you know what? This worked a few years ago. We need a fresh start. The beard's gone. And so All just right like that, then. the Rangers come back and they win games five, six, and seven. So, man, if this goes three to one and I, I shave again, I'd be nervous if I was you, Jared, because I'm two for two doing this. All right, then. Well, there's that. So I know if we go up three to one and you shave, I need to start shaking in my boots. But <laughs> exactly <laughs> thank you exactly. for having me on john thank you for coming on locked on hurricanes you guys can obviously find me on twitter and instagram at lo underscore hurricanes and my personal twitter is at jared ellis underscore 96 shows available on all streaming platforms and on youtube at locked on hurricanes so make sure you rate the show five stars on whatever streaming platform you're listening on and subscribe on youtube and john where can they find you at yeah, so I'm on Twitter, too, at jchick17. And uh, then you've got the Twitter handle for the podcast itself, which is at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. And, yeah, obviously, you know, give us a five-star review if you would be so kind. And, uh, Jared, listen, man, this this was a ton of fun, as it always is. I, I figure we got to do this at least once more before this uh, series comes to its conclusion. Absolutely. Hey, I'm off this weekend. All right. Sounds good. So, uh, yeah, Ranger fans, Kane fans, thank you guys as always. And uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Peace out.